Hello, everybody. How are you? It looks like people are still trickling in. Actually, I also just realized I have my window open and my window is making a lot of noise. Or rather, all these uh, cars outside are making a lot of noise. I'm just going to close the window. I'll be right back. <clears throat> all right. So I guess uh, it's the second last day of class. It seems to me that as we get closer and closer to the last day of class, the number of people who are in the room when I show up uh, becomes lesser and lesser. But I guess that should be true because after the last day of class, that number should be zero. Actually, speaking of which, some people made some comments about uh, asking. Uh, people asked me, will there be any, uh, any office hours uh, before the exam? Well, it turns out that our exam seems to be pretty late in the exam week. So the answer is yes. In fact, I'm going to continue to do office hours all the way up until the exam. And that means in terms of the Monday office hours, we have two more of them. One of them is going to be, I guess, next Monday. The other one will be literally the morning of the exam. And I'll also have one more Tuesday office hour. That's on Tuesday night. And also a comment, if any of you happen to be in different time zones and would like to take the alternate uh, final exam, I will make a same situation as I've been doing this entire semester, where there will be an alternate exam, same situation, same eight, I mean, different eight problems, but same format as the standard exam. And that one can be taken, it will be in the evening of the night of the final exam. And if you, <clears throat> if you want to do that, please send me an email um, so, that, so that you can do that. So that's all. And I guess just to be fair, we should do it so that the email needs to be sent by the top of the hour of like when the first exam starts. So you're not supposed to look at the first exam and say, I think these questions look uh, like ones I don't want to do, so I'll do the other exam instead. So that's all. I see that there's a question here. How many questions should we uh, suspect to complete on the exam? Five of eight? Well, honestly, I'm just going to be trying to make the exams roughly the same difficulty as last year and the year before and so on. So uh, I'll, I'll be just thinking of interesting problems that try to touch the concepts that we've talked about at a level of depth which requires about as much insight as the previous exams. A lot of people have given the feedback that the final exam feels less rushed because suddenly you have three hours to do eight problems as opposed to 50 minutes to do five problems. So uh, hopefully the time will not be as much of an issue, but uh, the idea is that you, you'll be using concepts that go throughout the entire course. Cool. So uh, and I, I'm doing the exam with like specific strict periods that people take it just to be as fair as possible for everyone. So um, I hope there will be not an easy way to just like look at the problems during some 24 hour period. Question. Will the class grades this year match historically uh, curving trends? Quite likely, yes. We'll, we'll see. I, I mean, I was actually quite happy with the way the exam scores turned out uh, uh, towards the exam two, exam three. So it's quite likely that that's going to be the case. But yeah. Any other questions about course, exam, and so on? OK. And again, if you have questions that you want to ask during office hours, you're welcome to come too. All right, and the final exam will cover everything up until what's at the end of tomorrow. And sorry, <laughs> what's at the end of Friday. And, and we're going to be touching on some of these topics, which we didn't get to talk, uh, talk about uh, this year in the class yet. So I'm going to continue on with talking about this Hall's theorem. This is this Hall's theorem that we had last time. So where we were is we were saying uh, the hard part of the proof of Hall's theorem. We were doing proof of Hall's theorem. And the hard part was the one where we said, you know, if you happen to have a graph, bipartite graph, and if you know that for every set S, the neighborhood is at least as big, then this perfect matching exists. So the hard part was given that for any S subset of the left, the size of the neighborhood was at least the size of S, show there is a perfect matching from left to right. OK. And the way we did this is, if you remember, we had this notion of an augmenting path, right? And that augmenting path, just to recall, that was the key concept. An augmenting path was something where we said, you know, if you happen to have some kind of a partial matching, 
where we had some edges which were in a partial matching. Here I've just drawn a few of them. Edges in a partial matching. Then if somehow I was able to, I don't know, have one of these new vertices uh, use the steel, steal that vertex there that was the partner of someone, then I have to undo the choice there. I'm kind of drawing it in a different order than I had last time, but doesn't matter. And then that vertex on the left has to go do another steal, and maybe it steals over there. And then uh, somebody has to undo their choice. And the next person, well, that person who undid now steals another one. And then they undo their choice. And then they go and steal another one. And then they undo their choice. But then, supposedly, uh, suppose this person is able to find a new one. Well, then this is an augmenting path, because in this kind of a situation, if you just said, OK, for this combination of steals and undoes, let's basically change all the yellows into pinks, and I will get more people matched with things, and more things matched as well. Is that familiar with people? That was this notion of this augmenting path. This means you can get bigger. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to show that every single not yet perfect matching if it's a partial matching, not yet perfect matching, then there's always an augmenting path. Goal is to show that given a not perfect partial matching, there's always an augmenting path. And with this always, it's like we are assuming, we're assuming that we have this neighborhoods are always as big as the sets themselves. Okay? So I'm now going to switch to another screen, and I want to draw a part of what we had drawn last time. So now we want to, I mean, I want to redraw, but I'll be doing things a little bit more carefully. So what I have now is I have some partial matching. And the partial matching might involve a lot of edges. I learned my lesson last time. Let's draw enough edges. Okay? So here's a whole bunch of edges. Partial matching. Okay. Now what we also have is we have some other vertices left. Vertices. More vertices. Okay. Now that we have all of these vertices, if you remember I made some sets. So I said, well, over here we have the set A. Over here we have the set B. Over here we have the set C, and over here we have the set D. Now, we assumed for the sake of contradiction that there was no augmenting path. That was one of the first things we did. Assume for a contradiction that there is no augmenting path. OK. Uh, once we assumed there was no augment augmenting path, we now knew something. We knew that the edges from the B uh, didn't go to the D. right? So we suddenly knew that somehow whatever edges there are in the B, there is something coming out of the B, because all these vertices themselves can be thought of as a set S. So some edges have to come somewhere, but they can't go to D, or else you'd immediately get augmenting paths. Okay. Oh, and I remember what I did is I was being careful. I was trying to say, you know, they go somewhere, right? They go to some places. They go to some places. And let's write the first thing. So there's no B to D edges. And then we started thinking about what augmenting paths would look like. And the thing that we observed is, look, if there's a way to go from here, let me make my thing a little bit easier for me to see. So if I go from something in the B, and I go over to here to something in the C, well, if I went back along this thing being like undoing, undoing the thing it was matched to, and if there was a way to get to D, that's an augmenting path. So an interesting observation is that these two particular endpoints that I have right here, uh, these two don't have any edges to D either. But this sort of cascades. That's what I got to as we closed up yesterday's, or the, the last class. It's like, well, suppose there was another edge like this. They're supposed to be adjacent. So you see, I have something that went up to here. And now somehow, if I was able to go 
you know, from this vertex in B over to here, back with an undo, going back across with a steel, back with an undo. If there was an edge down to D, well, now that would be an augmenting path too. Oh, great. Thanks for asking, Andrew. What's wrong with B to D again? Well, if there was any edge from B to D, then I could get an augmenting path immediately, where I just say, steel. Uh, like, well, nobody even is using it. It's just like, let's just, just add one more edge, and I'm done. This is the partial matching I've built so far, and I'm assuming that the partial matching isn't complete. So there's going to be some other vertices here, and that at least one vertex here. And if there was any way to go across, it's like, well, there's your augmenting path, one edge. We're assuming for contradiction, there's no augmenting path. OK? So now we know there's no B to D. We also know for a similar reason, there's no edge that's from any one of these points to D. Can anyone help me try to characterize, like, what? Is there a way to express there's a bunch of vertices here in A that have no edges to D either? Ah, just yeah. I want to make sure my sound works. For some reason, I can't hear you. Maybe my sound is messed up. Oh, no. My sound is messed up. What in the world happened? OK, <laughs> so one second. Uh, that's no fun if I can't hear you. I am going to have to get back out and get back in, because for some reason, uh, my sound thing stopped here. So oh, yes, that's right. So I'll be right back. Just a second. OK, hopefully this works. Uh, Jessia, could you try to say something again, just to, for me to check whether the sound works for me? Oh, no. It looks like I did something dumb. OK. One second. So that means that I, I tried plugging in. OK, so what actually happened is I tried plugging in another monitor. And by plugging in that other monitor, that actually messed up my sound connection. So I'm going to be right back. Just a second. In progress. Yay, I can hear now. OK, yay, I can hear now. I'm so sorry. I, I, tried, I tried plugging in another monitor, and that just shows that um, that was a mistake. OK, Jessie, yeah, I wish you'd be willing to say again what you had said. Well, OK, I said that um, anything in A that's connected by an alternating, like, alternating path, um, anything connected to that path is connected to the other path. Yeah. Yeah, so the key is that there's this notion of this alternating path now, right? So the situation is that. If you can go from like something in B to like steal, undo, steal, undo, whatever, and get somewhere ending in A on, the, on anything that's alternating ending in A, all those guys cannot connect to B. Uh, sorry, cannot connect to D directly. So what I'm going to write there is that no BD edges, edges and also every endpoint of an alternating path, not an augmenting path. I'm saying an alternating path is like a part of an augmenting path. Alternating path can end on A without getting all the way to the, to the, to the, to the end of the right side. And I call that, the reason why one is called augmenting instead of alternating is that the augmenting things actually augment. They make you get a bigger matching. But the alternating ones don't actually get you anything. They just happen to end on A. Uh, well, and on the left side. So just a quick thing here. Alternating path means it's like, like augmenting, <laughs> but not augmenting. So it's like augmenting, but end prematurely. 
on the left. Right? So that's like all the things that I could get to by alternating back and forth with an, uh, like an unused edge and then undoing, meaning going along a partial matching edge and then going to the right and then back and so on. And remember, there's like edges everywhere. I'm just saying that anything that you could reach from an alternating path, uh, from an alternating path, uh, every endpoint of an alternating path from B, comma, is not adjacent to D. Or else, if it was, then I get the alternating path turns into an augmenting path. Quick check-in. Did that statement make sense to people? Because this is one of the critical points in the proof. We're basically categorizing what could possibly go to D. And we know that the B can't go to D. And also any of these like gen uh, generalized Bs can't go to D, where these are like you could go from B along unmatched edges, like edges not used in the matching, and then back along a partial matching edge, and then you could go on some more maybe. And at some point you, you know, end at the A, Anything that you got here can't go down to D. OK. And actually, by the way, as you're going back and forth, you might even go up to there and then come back down to B. That's totally cool, too. Like, you can make these alternating paths where you do all kinds of weird bouncing back and forth. Like, I could bounce back down to B, and then maybe I could jump back up to here. Did this make sense? I'm just saying, like, anything you can get starting from B, bouncing back and forth and back and forth, where every time you're going right, you're stealing. So you use a not yellow edge. Every time you come left, you undo. So you use a yellow edge. And so on, see where you can get to on the left. And none of those are adjacent to D. Or else you'd be able to get an augmenting path. So now I get to choose my set S. And the set S that's going to be the one we use is going to be, well, let's just take all of these endpoints. Let's take B together with all of these endpoints, because here's a whole pile of stuff that's not adjacent to D. So let S B equal to B union this, every endpoint of an alternating path. Let's just write yellow this. Did that make sense to people? So this is just B union this. That's, that's all we have. And, and we're going to say that that's my set S over here. OK. Uh, why is that interesting? Well, now I have some set S. And the way I happen to draw this, uh, when you draw a graph, it doesn't really matter like what vertex you drew on the bottom versus on the top. All that matters is who is adjacent to who. And so what I have here is I have a bunch of stuff that is the endpoints of these alternating paths and also B. And in some books, if you look at this, they'll actually say that every vertex of B, you could also consider an endpoint of an alternating path also. It's just that the alternating path has length zero edges. It's just like it just starts there and it stops. OK? So some books will, will just say simply, let S be all of these. I'm just choosing to be explicit and tell everyone, yeah, it's B plus any one you can get to. But it's the same thing. Why is this interesting? I've just found out that the vertices of S are not allowed to be adjacent to the vertices down here. We're going to have to start taking apart this thing. It's like, OK, here's S. What else could I interestingly conclude? And uh, notice I'm emphasizing. I circled these three here because I, I sort of am assuming that I rearranged these edges so that these three are exactly the endpoints of these alternating paths. But in theory, it's like it could have been like these three and then like also that vertex. And I would have pulled that into S also. But then for the ease of looking at it, I, I kind of rearrange how I drew it. So it's like this. Uh, yes, just yeah. OK, so I need to somehow show that my size of the neighborhood of the S is too small. So I need to ask, where can my neighbors be? Well, my neighbors can't go to D. But so far, as I still have a lot of choices, right? Like, maybe that's big. So I need to make one more observation about where these edges are not allowed to go. Brayden, did you have some idea? OK, so the size of the set of neighbors, you're saying is like the size of the set of every endpoint of an alternating path. Do you mean like these three things? Yeah. OK, so you just made a key observation. Why is it true that S has no edges up there? I'm going to draw this line across. 
Maybe I'll make the line longer. I'll draw the line across like this. Brayden, you just made an interesting observation that says that all of this stuff here, B and endpoints of alternating paths from B, you're somehow saying they can't go up there. And I want other people to be involved. Like, why is that? That's a very important observation. Just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the thing is, like, if there was any edge from anyone down here up to there, well, then go steal up to there and then undo and look at that. That's another vertex that should also be an S. Did that make sense to people? That's why S was like endpoint of any alternating path. We kind of went as far as we could already, right? That's why the way I showed this is I first did from B to D and I was like, yep, no edges there. Then I showed like, oh, look at that. If something from B goes up to the right, well, now I've got a vertex on the left who has its matching partner, not allowed to go to D. And then we took another step further and said, well, but we could have this alternating path get there and that's nothing to D. So then we said, let's go to the full limit, all full extreme. Go find all the longest thing you can and claim that's it, that's the longest. Well, if that's the longest, everything that you could have gotten from alternating paths, you're not allowed to have anything there go up into the top. Or else, it wasn't the longest, because you would have been able to go undo one and put another guy in S. Let me write that down. That's the other key observation here. It's that somehow, hmm, we need to give some names of other things. So let me just give this a name. Uh, C prime, why not? That's C prime. Okay, C prime is smaller than C. It's just like whoever is matched from something in the A, which is not in the S. Okay, so C prime is equal to the matched partners of vertices in, I'll write it as A set minus S. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a very visual person, so I prefer just to look at it. The only reason I wrote this down explicitly is in case people are following and taking notes and or, or maybe want to look at it again later and see wait, why, why was this this way. All right. But that's it. So the C prime is those matched partners. So in that case, the, the key observation here is that there's no edges from S to C prime else what you could do is you could actually get a longer, uh, like you could get another vertex inside the alternating path endpoints. And S is then supposed to get bigger, but S was as big as it could get. Else could uh, continue alternating path and get bigger S contradicting that S was already at its full extent. Okay, that's like the power of that idea of going all the way. All right, now Braden's observation comes in, because look at this. So I have my set S. Who is it allowed to be neighbors with? Actually, only those matched ones over there. Now, can someone else explain to me why that forces the neighborhood of S to be strictly smaller than the set of S, the size of S, right? Because what I'm trying to contradict is that the neighborhoods are supposed to be at least as big as the size of S, but my claim is this neighborhood's going to be strictly smaller for some reason. Jutsia, you raised your hand. That's cool. Yes. Right. I, uh -huh. um, and there's, uh, so obviously there's some vertices in B because it's not already a perfect match, so it has to be, uh, so the vertices of B plus the already of the vertices of this is obviously more than um, the neighborhood of this, the vertices in this. Perfect. I'm just writing down your idea. This is perfect. That now there's at least one vertex in B since the partial matching was not perfect. That was the key initial observation, uh, initial assumption. Since the partial matching 
was not perfect. So that means that the size of the neighborhood of S is actually strictly smaller than the size of S, right? Like every vertex in the neighborhood of S has like some matched partner and there's more stuff. So uh, the size of S, I can actually say it's equal to the size of B plus the size of the neighborhood of S, which is strictly bigger than the size of the neighborhood of S, contradicting Hall condition. And that's actually the entire proof of Hall's theorem. So I'm going to pause here because we have managed to fit the entire proof of Hall's theorem onto one screen. Uh, of course, we had to say what is an alternating path, what is an augmenting path, so I'm slightly cheating. It's not really on one screen. But the, the whole principle is this picture. And actually, to be honest, uh, some people were at my office hours asking if I prepared my class, and I, I, I told them the truth, which is I wing it every time. But uh, the, the basic thing is I just know that the heart of the proof, whenever I need to make this proof, all I know is that the set S is like all the endpoints of the alternating paths. If you do that, you will win. That's just like where this is in my head. So and that's the key of the entire thing, because if you just like draw where you can get from these alternating paths, all we did is we followed our nose, right? We just said, um, OK, where are you allowed to have edges? Nowhere. So that's it. We're done. Uh, that's actually what's here. Any questions? I probably shouldn't have told you about the class until afterwards, but anyway. So, 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 like, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, this is this is. Uh, I mean, like after the FCEs, but anyway. So, 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 this thing here is the is the is like how we prove this entire Hall's theorem. Um, now, let let let's continue. Uh, okay, quick question. Any questions about Hall's theorem proof? Because now we're just going to go and talk about using it and other stuff. Okay, then I'm going to make a comment about the efficiency. Remember we said the Hall's theorem, like if you have to go and check every set S and every neighborhood, that's like exponential time. This is not exponential time. This is actually super fast. Super fast meaning it's polynomial time in that you could do it. My general um, benchmark for is it exponential time or is it polynomial time is if I really had to do it, would I be able to do it? And the answer is yes, I would. All I would do is I would draw something. I would start from here, attempt to explore out. That's called breadth first search or like seeing where I can reach. And pretty soon I have my big set S. And like then I'll for sure I'll be able to find something out. Because in the real thing, if you do satisfy Hall condition, you'll be able to find some way out. And then you'll just be like, hooray, I got one more edge. And you just do this a few times and you're done. So this is actually giving you a polynomial time algorithm to find perfect matchings, which is nice. But now we're going to go back into the theory side and say, why would anyone care about the Hall condition? Well, it turns out there's a very interesting corollary of this whole Hall's theorem. The corollary is, you know, if you have any uh, bipartite graph and it happens to be what's called regular, meaning every vertex has the same degree, then it always has a perfect matching. Every regular uh, bipartite graph has a perfect matching. Ah, every time I write ing, my, my g gets uh, pulled into the n. And regular here means that all degrees are equal. All right, so, so what we have here is that every regular bipartite graph has a perfect matching. Uh, I guess I should say from left to right, uh, because that's how we always define perfect matchings. And one of the interesting things that should make you stop right away is like, hang on a second, how, how do you even know that the right side's bigger than the left side? A bigger equal than the left side. If all I told you is all the degrees are the same, you know, like what if I had a bipartite graph where you know all the degrees are the same, but somehow it looks like this. And maybe all the degrees are the same somehow. You know, they're all the same. Can this be? Obviously not. Why not? This is going to be one of the important parts of the, the proof. So one of the first obvious things to look at is like, uh, hang on a second, how do I even know the right side is bigger than the left side? Uh, sorry, how do I know the right side is bigger or equal to the left side? Just from the fact that all the degrees are the same all degrees equal on left and on right and with each other. Let's put some letters while we're waiting for ideas. I've got a left side, it's called L. Got a right side, it's called R. We have some degrees. All degrees are equal 
to D. Is there a way that I can use to say that the right side is at least the left side? Brayden. Aha. Uh -huh. So so actually it's going to be equal. And that, that, that should make sense too, because if I was able to say, hey, if I have all degrees being the same, then the right side is always bigger than the left side. Then you're like, wait, but then, then that means that by symmetry, the left side is always bigger than the right side. And then you, you just like, you can't do that, right? So actually what ends up being, what ends up happening is that the two sides are equal size. And the handshake lemma is the right way to think of it. The way you can, the way I often think of it is it's like, I have, these people are throwing balls and these people are catching them. Everyone throws D balls, everyone catches D balls. Okay, so I've got these balls which are flying across. And the, this is just how my brain works. But when I throw the balls, I have L times D balls going over, right? Because everyone's throwing D balls. And then over here, everyone's catching D balls. So that tells me that the number of catchers should be the number of balls divided by D, right? Uh, each person, vertex, let's call it vertex, just because I used the other analogy before where the right side was things, but each vertex on R catches exactly D balls, implies the number of catchers is equal to the number of balls, LD, divided by how many each catcher caught, and you're done. So the number of catchers, by the way, was R. Oh, I should probably have put some, should probably have put some kind of vertical bars, like absolute values to say size of a set. Let's just do that so that I don't uh, use bad notation here. And that's equal there. So we're good. So the right side is equal to the left side. So that's quite satisfying. This thing shows that just from the regular bipartite graph, I got this property that at least the right side and the left side are equal. But that's the more interesting thing is there's a perfect matching. Well, if there's a perfect matching, what else could I say? I mean, what else, how, how would I show this? I guess I need to go and check the Hall condition. That's the, that's the point of Hall's theorem. Because you see, this one is inconvenient to say, I just went and found augmenting paths. Because how, I, what do, I don't know anything about my graph. All I know is that it's regular, right? So now let me see if I can just try to show that the Hall condition is true if all I know is that the graph is regular. So the proof is actually probably going to fit here. We just need to check the Hall condition. And this thing here was a warm-up, by the way. That's why I just did this. But the proof is check the Hall condition. And the way you always check the Hall condition is you say, let's start with an arbitrary subset S of the left. So I guess I have my picture over here. So let's just choose something here. They don't have to be all right next to each other, but it's just easier for me to draw this way. Pick an arbitrary subset S of the left. I'm just going to write L-E-F-T. Even though it's the set L, I'm just writing L for left, uh, and I'll write the whole thing. So I pick an arbitrary subset. I need to explain why that arbitrary subset has at least as big of what it can fan out into. And so everything has to go to two things, right? And so I have on the right-hand side, whoever the N of S is, Is there any way to explain why n of s is necessarily at least as big as s using like this kind of thinking? That's why I did this first. Can you think of a story or an analogy or something that would explain why n of s has to be at least as big as s? Size of n of s, at least the side of s, because Brayden. So what I like here is this is this notion of the, the catching of the balls, right? It's like, and, and what the, why I wanted to compare these is because over here I have an equal sign. 
And what we're about to get is a not equal, is an inequality. And there's one difference. And the one difference is, well, maybe I'll, I, I guess we'll see as I write it. It's like, there is still some number of balls going over. And each vertex, so let, let's write that sentence, because there's like the set of s, size of s, times d, balls go over. But each vertex of n of s, meaning like that's who, who are the catchers, they don't catch exactly d balls each. There is a situation by which it might be that these s, there's all these edges which go across, but it could be that one of these vertices in n of s, it was catching a ball from someone not in s. Does that make sense? The only rule I'm making is that every vertex has the same degree, and so all these things in S have the same degree. All these things on the N of S have the same degree. But some of the degrees from N of S might go to uh, throwers who are outside of S. And that's just the only place that's different from this thing we did with the left and the right. The left and the right, there's no other throwers. This was the entire set of throwers. Okay? But each vertex of N of S catches less than or equal to D balls. And that implies that the size of n of s, which is equal to the number of catchers, is equal to uh, the size of s times d divided by this d. But now I divide by the d. Ooh, 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 ooh. Not equals. Not equals anymore. It's bigger equal. It's bigger equal because the point is if your catchers have less hands or whatever, uh, you need more catchers. So, so then this thing here, and that's equal to the size of s. Bang! That's the Hall condition. Poof! So now there's a perfect matching. So that's like how powerful the Hall condition is. We didn't have to do a single algorithm. We just theoretically analyzed all two to the power um, size of l subsets. And there must be a perfect matching. Oh, aha! Yes! Thank you, Chris. So now this is actually kind of interesting. So uh, wait a second. Each degree is d. So there's a perfect matching, huh? What if we took it away? That was actually the corollary corollary. So the second core. So first of all, any questions on this yet? This, this is just like, just check the Hall condition. But this is a very useful thing to know. If you're ever checking the Hall condition, you just say, grab a set. Look at what it could go to and, and see. OK, now we've proved corollary. Time for corollary corollary. Yes? Back on the last screen. Back on the last screen. No problem. Ah, it's be thanks for asking. It's because every degree is d. We're starting with like it's a regular graph. All degrees are d. Since all the degrees are d, now if I have a vertex of n of s, its degree was d, but how many balls from s did it catch? The important thing here is I'm only throwing balls from s. Maybe I should have made that very very clear. In this picture, over here, now only s throws balls, not all, not necessarily all of L. Is that even how you spell necessarily? Necessarily all of L. Did that help to explain it? Cool. Yes, so the ba basic thing is that S is throwing balls. And we already know that from the structure of the graph, there's like some edges everywhere. Like every vertex has D edges uh, coming out of it. And some of those happen to go to the S, and some of them happen to go to the outside of S. That's why I have a less than or equal to D over here. OK? Cool. Now let's go to the corollary corollary. Corollary corollary says, uh, now I know that every regular bipartite graph has a perfect matching from left to right. Well then. What if I just took it away? So, uh, well, I'll write every regular bipartite graph. I'm not going to write the conclusion yet, because I want to write the proof, and then that would be cool. Uh, the proof, yes, this is not a complete sentence yet, but like, I, want to, I want to write the proof first. The proof is, get the first perfect matching and remove those edges exactly. Get a perfect matching. Remove its edges. 
Oops. So what just happened? So I have my perfect matching. Oh yeah, by the way, very importantly, left and right have the same size. We know that already. And so now we took away this perfect matching. I'm just going to use some dot, dot, dots to indicate that some edges got taken away. These are like ghost edges. We, we took them away. OK? Ghost. Actually, it's, uh, ghost is not a technical term. That's why it's hard to read. Let me write it more clearly. These are ghosts. Those are not edges anymore. OK. Can anyone tell me what I have now? I have like a, I had D, all the vertices were degree D before. Before, all degrees are equal to D. How about after? <laughs> Andrew? Um, with all of the degrees being equal to D minus 1. Hmm, now what can you do? Uh, you can make another perfect matching. You can do it again. And you keep doing it. You keep doing it until all the degrees are equal to 0. What have you just gotten? You just managed to take a, per a regular bipartite graph, and you managed to break it apart into a disjoint union of perfect matchings. That's kind of satisfying. OK, now all equals d minus 1. Keep going until all degrees are equal to 0. Hmm. Well, in that case, if I go to every regular bipartite graph, I can finish the sentence and say, can be decomposed, partition, partition, let's use that word, can be partitioned into a disjoint, edge disjoint union. Let me use the, let me be clear, it's the edges are disjoint. Edge disjoint union of perfect matchings. Now that actually has like real world uh, consequences, uh, like real world practical consequences. Suppose you were trying to do some kind of a sports matchup or something. Here I am trying to pretend that I knew something about sports. But like suppose you had like a bunch of teams and another bunch of teams and for whatever reason you wanted to have them play against each other in some way where it just so happened that each team was supposed to play the same number of other teams. Then you could, and suppose these were supposed to be matchups, that you, you have some field that they can be playing in parallel. Then in theory, you could just like have all these games being run in the most efficient way possible, where at the first round, all these people play. In the second round, a different set of games happen, and they never have to repeat the same game, and it's like everyone's always playing. OK, I made up a funny analogy, but like that. That's, that's useful. And people do actually think about stuff like this, maybe not with games, but also these kinds of ideas are related to combinatorial designs, which are related to things like vaccine testing and like uh, statistical designs of experiments. So th this is like related to some real stuff too. And that finishes what we were going to do with the uh, Hall's theorem. So now we have this very nifty uh, corollary corollary. Could you have used this to prove it from the beginning uh, in the sense that, ah, because the n minus 1 case that must be true. OK, OK. I see, I see. OK, that's an interesting question, Chris. So the thing here is, like, could we have sort of built up to this by saying, well, if I happen to have something that's a partitioned uh, out of perfect matchings, and I just go and have one more degree, is it, isn't it clear that you just made that by adding one more matching on top? So this is the difference between when you think about induction. You need to be thinking of making things. You need to be thinking of taking your problem and doing a divide and conquer. The way you just described it is you were trying to build up a problem. You were trying to say, well, any situation where all the degrees are the same, that necessarily arises from a bunch of perfect matchings plus one more. That's not completely obvious that you can manufacture every regular graph, bipartite graph, by starting with a one less regular one and then sticking on a matching, unless you already knew that the matching was there in the first place. So it's, it's one of these things where when you want to prove something, you need to have a divide and conquer mentality of, I get anything. I don't know what it is. And how do I show that I can even do that partition into the perfect matching and the what's left? OK. Any other questions on this? If not, I'm going to then go on and touch on something that we will start talking about. And then we'll have, the, I guess, the finale in the next class. So. The next thing is to talk about uh, coloring of graphs. And this is a simple concept I can start talking about in the last few minutes we have today. 
I was already dropping it so many times when I was saying like three colorable when I was talking about tripartite or two colorable when I was talking about bipartite. You see, you can actually talk about, I'll write vertex in parentheses, but we always, we, not we always, we often talk about coloring vertex, vertices. So if I just say coloring a graph, I'm going to be talking about coloring its vertices, which is why actually when I was doing the Ramsey stuff, I kept being very careful to say edge coloring, because typically coloring is coloring vertices. But I will always try to be as precise as I can. Vertex coloring of a graph. Ooh, I want to add one more word, a proper vertex coloring of a graph. Proper vertex coloring of a graph is just like a way of coloring the vertices so that you don't put the same color next to another uh, vertex of the same color. It's an assignment of colors to every vertex such that no same colors are adjacent. Okay. Now you might ask, why would anyone ever care about coloring graphs? Well, actually, one of the most useful examples which I saw when I was growing up was when you have like the map of the United States of America, which looks like this. Actually, no, it doesn't. But uh, this is like some map of some random uh, place. So this is just like a map. Uh, this is not the United States. This is just some, some map. And as we all know from geography class, if you want to color the countries in a map, then you might actually care about coloring the countries so that you don't have uh, the green country next to the green country, right? And then somehow it's kind of interesting, if you ever think about it, that when you look at those geography books, somehow, well, let's use another blue. Somehow it's not like it needs the whole Crayola box, if you know what I mean. Like, it's actually quite interesting, if you think about it. Like, I, I mean, when I took geography in sixth grade or whatever, I didn't think of this. But in retrospect, if you look at the map, it's very convenient that they don't need to have, like, 100 colors. In fact, how many colors do they need? So in the map, uh, you, you, you can somehow color so that no same colors across borders. And there's this, like, really famous, famous theorem, uh, which, which is called the four color theorem. Uh, but that's telling you how many colors that you need. But there's a very interesting theorem. It's called the four color theorem, which says that if I have any graph that comes from something related to this, and that's called a planar graph, okay? And we're going to talk about, not the four color theorem, but we'll talk about planar graphs and coloring in the last lecture. But a four color theorem says that every planar graph can be vertex colored using, let me give more space, using at most four colors. Now I want to just define what is a planar graph. Planar graph just means that you could draw the graph with its vertices in the plane where you have no edges which cross each other. Planar graph means can be drawn in the plane with no crossing edges. And just to talk a little bit about this map, how am I able to draw this map in the plane with no crossing edges? Actually, I can. The way I would do this, let me just clear all this out. If I wanted to draw this map as a graph in the plane, well, what does that actually mean? When I talk about like two different countries having the same color, I just think of it as drawing a capital in each of them. So each of the countries has a capital. And what we'll do is we'll just like make roads between capitals, for which the road means that these two countries share a border. So in this graph is that an edge equals share a border. And I don't mean just like on a corner, because that would be silly. It's like a non-corner. And most parts of the world don't have like 50 countries all sharing a corner. And, and also in the geography book, it's OK if the two things on the opposite corners have the same color. Uh, share a border, not just a corner. OK? And so I could do this. And if you can see, I've just managed to make a graph where I think I did. Yep, I've just managed to make a graph here where somehow 
uh, if the two uh, capitals are connected, that's exactly when, uh, are, are adjacent, that's exactly when they share a border. And the question of coloring is just one that boils down to, could you actually give each vertex a different color? The color of the capital is the color of the country. So I'm just trying to show that these are all related. And what we'll do next time is we'll be talking about the theory as much as we can of the theory of planar graphs of like, how, I mean, somehow some graphs you can draw in the plane with no crossing edges, some you can't. And we'll be talking about some of the theory of the planar graphs. We won't get to prove the four color theorem in this class. Uh, actually, I think you, you can probably see the proof of it in, uh, actually, I don't know. I don't know the proof of it. It uses a computer. But you might be able to learn in John Mackey's class about, uh, about graph theory, a lot, a lot more about the four color theorem. Uh, not just John Mackey, we've got lots of professors who do this kind of stuff. But bottom line is that we won't be able to get here. Uh, I actually think in this class, we probably won't be able to get to the six color theorem either. On the other hand, I, I will say that these mythical notes of the class will actually uh, materialize at some point. And in the mythical notes of the class, there will be a proof of the six color theorem. And we'll be building up towards that in the last class, which is next time. All right, see you guys. Yep. Yeah.